Uh, hi everyone, thanks for waiting. I think we can start our session now. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to join our online webinar today. Our topic today is best practices for soybean application with joints. And my name is Michael. Uh, everyone can see my screen, right? Uh, hi, Eric. My uh, the slides and the voice is clear, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And my name Good. is Michael. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And my name is Michael, solution engineer from DGI Agriculture Team. And very glad to meet everyone here. Today, we are honored to invite Mr. Eric Mitchell to share his work on drone applications. Uh, hi, Eric. Uh, can you say hello to everyone? Hello, everybody. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for, for tuning in today. And for those of us that, that are watching it on the recording, uh, just thanks a lot for taking the time to, to share this experience with us. Um, we worked real hard to put this workflow together, and uh, I hope it can be a, a, of value to everybody and kind of make everybody successful that wants to get in this industry. Thank you, Eric. Uh, actually, Eric already applied drones on crops protection for more than three years from uh, the 2020, and uh, he is also a uh, head capture pilot at the same time for more than nine years. So he has lots of professional experience uh, for the area spring to talk today. And next, let us start the webinar today. And uh, here will be three parts in, today, in today's webinar. In first part, I will introduce the advantages of drones and uh, uh, especially the application on soybean. And in second part, Eric will introduce his practices of drone spraying and spreading on soybean, like mapping, spraying, and spreading, and some comparison between drones and airplanes. And in the final part, we will make some summaries and give some solution recommendations for spraying and spreading. So here is the first part, and I will talk about why, sorry. Uh, why drones on soybean and when we can use drones for soybean. And first, I want to talk about the drones flexibility on some special fields. As all we know in real world, there will always be some special factors for the farmlands, right? Like this, the small irregular shaped fuse plots and the obstacles in the fuse, like irrigation pivot, irrigation pivot and the power line, right? And uh, we, we cannot expect there is always open and super flat for the fuse. And uh, I think almost half of the fuse in the full of such obstacles. And uh, there is also some kinds of hilly and mountain-like landscapes like this. All of such fuse are very hard for other aerial machine to work like head capture and airplane. And even sometimes it is hard for the ground machine to work, but for Agriculture drones, it is very flexible for those fuels. And uh, and uh, also we are facing the challenges from the ground. And the first one after ring work is always the hot, you know, hard kick top hot issue for tractors. The soil will be very too wet to move, right? Even the tractor will be trapped in the field like this after wind, after rain, especially during the rain season. And also another issue, the soil compactions caused by wheel track, and it is also harmful for the crops. And also when you drive the tractor in the field, I think it must well leave the wheel track, which will result in yard loss, right? So, but for drones, we can skip such challenges and issues directly and avoid all of this. And also for drones, you can use it for many kinds of applications like the such new new options like spot spring and variable spring and uh, you know because the drone adopts the digitalization and ai technology and we can recognize the weed and fungi fungi in the field automatically and then uh, based on such information we can use the drone to perform a target oriented a target operation 
and no matter uh, you use the drone manu uh, manually or automatic fly and the bullshit is OK. And the, here we have some examples for the spot spring and variable spring. And we have adopted on the wheat spot spring and they use the AI technology and uh, the RGB uh, imagery to recognize the weeds on the field automatically, and then perform more target spot spring on the field. It will save your chemicals and save your time. And also, we can also recognize the fungi uh, on the crops automatically with AI and digitization technology. And to realize the variable spring on the field, the fungicide variable spring, it also will save your chemical and you know time. So this is the new options uh, can, re can be realized by drones. And also, except for the spring, we can also use the same drone to spread seeds like cover crops, which is very familiar you know, with, uh, mm -hmm. with us, with our, uh, our application. And uh, the only thing you need to do with the drone to do the cover crop spreading is to change the spring tank to a swappable spreading system. The whole process is very easy to do and uh, so for spring and spreading is all in one drone and another here uh, the adva advantage for drone is you can spread cover crops without destroy any crops as all we know sometimes we need to plant cover crops before harvesting right this point is very important because we need to plant it before the harvesting so if we use a ground spreader, it will must leave some wheel track and uh, cause the yield loose on the ground. But when you use the drone, you will never worry about this point because drone is always on the sky. He won't contact or uh, you know contact and destroy the crops directly. So you can save lots of the yield on the ground when you use drone to spread the cover crops. This is another advantage from drones here. And here, uh, this page, uh, we will discuss when we can use the drones for soybean. And actually, there are a total three stages and three kinds of operation we can do for soybean using drones. The first one, the first one and the most important one is the fungicide application. It all uh, generally, uh, it will be performed during our three stage. A three stage, and this is a very key window for fungicide application. It will uh, allow you five or ten days to perform the fungicide on the soybean. To uh, to uh, you know, if we if we didn't spray the if we don't spray the fungicide on the soybean, it must or decrease our yield finally. So a three stage is a very key window for the drones application to spray the fungicide on soybean. This is a very important application now. Another application happened uh, during R6 to R7. R6 to R7. It's uh, generally it's for the full season soybean. People will plant the cover crop for full season soybean bef uh, before harvesting, especially on during R6 to R7 stage. It will uh, fertilize the soil and for the next year's uh, next year's growth. So when people bought when people bought uh, drones for spring and next season before before the harvesting, you know, mostly more and more people now they will use drone to spread the cover crops. And also uh, next uh, we are to the next day iteration, right? Next round, next planting, and before the V stage, people, you know, we we, we need to perform the burn down herbicide, burn down a pre emergency herbicide spring. Right, and uh, also more and more people we heard and they start to use the drone to do this stage. And also if they plant the cover crops on the field, they will also use the same drones which they used for the cover crop spreading. And they will use the same drone to spring the burnout herbicide for the cover crops. This is very, you know, another very interesting application. It's very good. And that's all the stage we can uh, hear about and for the drones application on soybean when we can use it. 
So that's all the content about why we use drones on soybean and the why and when we can use drones on soybean. And next, uh, Eric will introduce his work on drone applications. This is a very, very key topic today. And he will introduce the many contents like the mappings, spraying and spreading. Uh, all of this is very important for the uh, for the normal and daily operation using the drone. And but before his presentation, uh, here I want to let everybody know there is a, an awesome, very, very awesome record for Eric's team this year. This year, there is no any farmers complaint and crash, drones crash happened for their team. It's a very awesome record. So now let's learn his secret. Uh, hi, Eric, I think you can start your presentation now. Okay, Mike, I'm going to share my, my screen. Yes, I will end my sharing. I think I can share now. Okay, let's go to... Okay, so... I'm going to start with introducing uh, to myself. Um, I'm Eric Mitchell, uh, founder of Row Crop Ag. We uh, initially were, were founded in 2020 as a helicopter custom application uh, company primarily. And um, I'll kind of get into some of my background as to how we got to that point. Uh, I spent 10 years in the Air Force. Uh, six years of that, I was working in some um, radio and communications type positions. And I didn't realize it back then, but I'd use those skills 20 years later in an industry that hadn't even you know, been, been developed yet. And then I spent four years at Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base, um, had a great time there, and then uh, left the Air Force. Um, I, I got an aeronautics degree from Embry-Riddle University. And uh, again, learning concepts that I would later put to use in this drone industry. And in 2012, I went to helicopter flight training out in Utah. Um, one of the benefits out there was learning how to fly in a high, high altitude, high density altitude environment. Um, you know, physics is our best teacher when it comes to aviation. So with a high DA, we didn't have to simulate what it's like to fly hot and heavy. And um, that was a very valuable lesson there. And I went ahead and used those lessons to go on as a certified flight instructor and a certified flight instructor in instruments um, teaching in helicopters. So and I didn't realize it back then, but I'm using that to this day uh, with the Row Crop Academy. Uh, so we are, you know, we're, we're teaching guys how to fly these things and how to, how to utilize this workflow and put it to work in the field. Uh, after I was a CFI, I went on to fly in New York City, and I got really comfortable with airspace and radios. Uh, so that was that was a really good experience there. Uh, and that's one of the things we teach the Row Crop Academy is getting you know getting used to using that radio and feeling comfortable. Uh, then I left New York City and went on to the to fly in the White Mountains uh, with JBI helicopters, which is a top notch operation. Uh, I learned how to do some ag work flying on cranberries and timber. And I realized very quickly that there's a lot more to agriculture aviation than just flying an AV line. Uh, that's, that's just a small portion of it. So I learned a lot about calibration, uh, proper application heights, swath width, and efficacy, most importantly. In 2017, I left JBI and went on to Arkansas. I took a medevac position, flying medevac uh, in central Arkansas. And Arkansas is home to about a million acres of rice that's all aerial applicated. So I went into, while I was flying medevac, I started my, my own flying service with helicopters. And we continued that operation uh, straight through to 2020. Primarily, primarily focusing on the helicopters, but keeping an eye on the drone technology that was emerging. And with the release of the T-30, it was pretty clear that this industry was headed in, in a, the right direction and it was we'd be able to utilize this in our operation. 
we probably went in with a little bit more confidence uh, that we could leverage all the lessons learned from the helicopters than we probably should have. So we learned very quickly that there are some there are some unique challenges that come with the drones, and that was just through through trials and tribulations. Um, you know, every time we'd kind of come up, come up to a challenge, we'd try to mitigate that with a unique solution. And, and you know, one of the things that that really we, we didn't anticipate being a big factor was the maps. That was our probably our biggest challenge to overcome. We were used to taking a paper map that somebody drew that, you know, showed a road on there and, you know, you have that in your helicopter seat and you go out there, you find the field and you applicate it. That doesn't really work for drones that well. Uh, you know, their reality is digital. So we, we learned the hard way that you really need to, to have a good mapping program, a really good understanding of the technology and how to utilize that. Uh, and then the T-40s came along. And we were able to, to put all those lessons learn, learned into play, and it helped us build a, a really solid program. We fine-tuned that GIS component of our business, got really serious about mapping. And, and uh, you know, as Michael mentioned, every field that we had RTK boundaries and maps on were, was a success. Uh, we've never had challenges flying on good maps. We've only experienced challenges flying on maps that we either created in the field on the fly or just didn't take the, the, the proper amount of time and employ the uh, proper mapping procedures to lay down good boundaries and identify all the obstacles. And that kind of brings us to where we are today. Uh, we're finishing up the 2023 season. We've spread over 50,000 acres with our fleet and with our program. And we launched, recently launched the Row Crop Academy, where we're offering two courses, a five-day mapping course to go over this workflow in detail, and a five-day T40 course hands-on in the field to go through all the scenarios that pose challenges. Uh, we fly uh, eight T40s and five T30s and a fleet of five mapping drones, Mavic 3 Enterprise line drones. So we're going to start off here by talking about a comparison between the T40 and an 802 air tractor. Uh, this, the, both these fields were flown on the exact same day, uh, the same hybrid of corn. And now, great, this is about soybeans, this, this uh, webinar, but this is just a, you know, just a, a good comparison here on corn. Uh, the field on the left, you can see some damage from some water damage. This is a bottom, really good flying, uh, but that's not really what we're focusing on here. We're focusing on that uh, this was getting close to harvest and fungicide having an increased sustainability component to it. It tends to hang on a little longer to the, to the you know, healthy biomass. Now, here on the left, this was a T40 uh, that sprayed this. You can see the field boundary right here. We're not seeing too much, really any streaking at all. We've got really good coverage all the way down through here. But what you will notice is there's a buffer that we left right here for next to this highway. So you can tell where the, where the chemical had less efficacy and that kind of tells us that we would see that throughout this field if the application was poor. On the right, this air tractor was flying at the exact same time, roughly, that we were, we were spraying across the road. Uh, you can see some striping or some overlapping, especially right in this area here where he made his trim pass. So that tells you that there was spray efficacy here, and he came back through and overlapped it. Uh, but you're going to see this, it's not quite as consistent across the, the crop canopy as you're getting with the drones. Michael, can you hear okay? Yes, very clear. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so moving on here, now we're going to compare the helicopter. 
Now, this is this is something. I mean, I'm a helicopter pilot at heart. You know, I'm passionate about flying helicopters and uh, have really put a lot of work into refining my craft. But one of the things that we really couldn't ignore as this this technology was was maturing was the efficacy that you can achieve with the drones and that's always been our that's always been our angle with a helicopter versus an airplane you know we're out there trying to achieve better efficacy than the airplane can and get into tighter more dynamic uh, you know flight profiles and environments safely so i would compare the drones to the helicopter as the helicopter is to the airplane you know it's just one step further and the, the argument is, is still the same you know, a helicopter compared to an airplane on big on big acres, you know, some would argue is less efficient. Um, we got the same argument with the with the drone versus the helicopter. And so, what you're seeing there is a direct relation between efficacy and efficiency. Um, like we mentioned before, the drone's reality is digital. We create that. It doesn't know that it's in in this field. I mean, it does via GPS, but it's it doesn't know that you know, what this environment consists of, we tell it what that, what that consists of as far as being proactive. You know, it knows when it creates that route, that there's an obstacle here because we identified it in our mapping step of the workflow. Uh, a drone's best application profile that we found is to applicate between 2.5 to three gallons per acre and an application height ranging from 12 to 20 feet, depending on the terrain. Now, 20 feet seems excessive, but if you've got really varying terrain, you're looking for a an average application height versus a you know, consistent application height. It just allows the, the drones uh, terrain following systems to you're kind of working with the limitations there uh, and trying to avoid lockouts and stay consistent and uh, you know maintain a, a steady efficiency. Now. This does result in a phenomenal efficacy versus the helicopter. Now, the helicopter does struggle to achieve similar efficacy in complex environments, mostly because of the, the requirement of having to, to climb out and turn outside of the field. The drone never really leaves the field except to, to come back to refill and, and to swap batteries, where the helicopter, we're leaving the field every pass. You know, especially that's an issue around large power lines, you know, structures, mature trees, those dog legs and, and fingers that we find in some of these irregular shaped fields pose an issue as they tighten up. You know, we don't have a choice in the helicopter but to come up with an altitude. You know, and if, it, if it's a super hot day, we're really not getting a good efficacy at all, um, but it's it's better than an airplane with a helicopter. And that's always been the argument. The industry standard is two gallons per acre. Now there are there are exceptions to that, but that seems to be, from my experience, that's been the, uh, the industry standard, just two gallons per acre. Now, anybody with experience in, in this field knows that at two gallons, we do experience some some evaporation on days, especially around the edges, especially around obstacles and challenges, uh, because of that having to having to pull out of the field. You know, we have two things going on there. We've got atomization of the chemical from the rotor wash and we've got just evaporation because of the heat. Uh, and let's get into the more specifics related to challenges associated with the drone operation that we found with the helicopter versus the drones. Now with the helicopter, we've always somewhat structured our, our workflow to try to find a central landing zone and branch out from there. A lot like you see here in this picture with kind of a hub and spoke type approach. We incorporated that into our drone operation, but on a much smaller scale. And in this example here, even within that field. So we tried to find an access point that was gonna allow us to spray this 300 acre track uh, centrally. It actually required two different landing zones but you know that that was one of the things that, that came with experience uh, we didn't really have this this part down 100 percent in our our first our first approach to this uh we just learned that if you can get if you can get these drones 
to start spraying as soon as possible and get some of that weight off of the, the airframe, that battery runtime becomes less, less of an issue. So really your number one constraint is access, not battery life. Battery life becomes a problem because of poor access. Uh, we realized very quickly that it, in order to, to come up with a, a game plan in the framework for good access, we really needed good maps. So this, this is where the RTK base maps come in. We can get a real life, real today uh, site picture and situational awareness of what that track consists of. We can see the power lines, we can see guy wires, uh, we can see structures. We can see if there was a, a, a fence row that was taken out in the previous season. All those things factor in for access. We can see if there's if there's standing water in a field or if there's uh, obstructions on a road that we would typically use to access prior to going out there. These are all things that kind of help out offset that lack of efficiency that, that you think you have with the drones versus the helicopter. And it makes for a, a much safer flight profile when you're going through the, the application portion of the workflow. Now, safe boundaries, this is subjective, but in our operation, we define that as boundaries that allow for safe flight along field edges. You have overhanging branches, mature timber, you've got power lines, much like in a, with a helicopter, our biggest concern would be we don't have, a, we don't have a, a structure in a field like a pole or a cross country wire structure, but you've got a span going across the corner of a field or sometimes even a, a, a an old structure that was there and there's a wire going to it that you don't see a connector you know that's that's typically a, a a major challenge for helicopter crews is looking for those those types of of obstacles um, they're equally as important for the drones so having a safe boundary a safe flight along field edges identifying the obstacles and maintaining visual line of sight throughout the route. So with a three or with a RTK base map, we can draw out what line of sight would look like. We can draw a straight line from where our proposed LZ would be to all the corners of that, of that track, that boundary. Now, coincidentally, if it's a, if it obstructs line of sight, it also obstructs line of signal. So it's a pretty good, a pretty good rule of thumb and a best practice to, to utilize that on the computer where we've got a nice, a nice situational awareness established where we can see if we're going to potentially lose signal and mitigate that with maybe a different landing zone. Okay, so here we've got a best practice for mapping. This is our workflow that we've developed. We struggled with this in the beginning. Um, because all of our maps were Google Earth based as a base map. And it was very, you know, it was very loose because in the helicopter, I can look out the, the, the door and see where that tree line stops. And I can see where that power line is. And I can see, you know, a proper buffer from that structure. You, we didn't really have good maps for the drones. So we had to figure out how do we migrate this database where we've developed all these fields with names that the customers, as a custom operation, as the customers had come in and mapped and uh, basically built a work order for us, how do we make this usable? So we use Google Earth to identify the fields that we're going to go out and map. So essentially the, the old helicopter boundaries that we would fly and spray now became our mapping missions. So we create that route boundary. We export that boundary as a KML, which is one of the formats that, that a Mavic enterprise line, you know, the RC Pro can, can uh, digest. So we import that KML into the smart controller. And we've used both the, the Mavic 3 Enterprise and the Mavic 3 Multispectral. Both drones have a mechanical shutter and make for very efficient mapping. 
And from that point there in the workflow, we're going to go into the data capture portion. So we've got the boundary uploaded into the remote. We've put all our parameters in on there. We told it, you know, how we want all of our overlapping and, and, and whatnot. And we go out and we fly the mission with an RTK. We use the DJI DRTK2. That's been that's worked great for us. Uh, we've never had an issue with that that baseline. I haven't really had much experience with the N-Trip. I know some guys like to use that, but we've uh, we've just had great success with the RTK2. So we, ca we capture all the imagery, and now we bring all that imagery back into the office. And here's where here's where uh, all the heavy lifting happens. So we found that DJI Terra works great for, for us because we stay within the DJI ecosystem. And we're gonna create all these RTK high resolution agriculture maps in 2D. Uh, one of the things that we're gonna do after we create that reconstruction is we're gonna check the quality report, make sure everything looks good. All the digital surface models look good and uh, we can kind of get an idea what, how this track lays out from an elevation standpoint for access. First thing we're going to do is we're going to identify any obstacles before we lay any boundaries, because that's in a lot of ways that's going to that's going to affect our boundary itself, and it's going to affect where we identify possible access points. So after the obstacles are identified, we're going to look for suitable access, and much like that last slide, we're going to look for some place that's going to kind of give us uh, with minimal moves adequate access and you know, with all those factors that we previously talked about. We're going to create our spray boundaries. And then here's the real value of Terra. We can upload those boundaries to the Agris cloud right from Terra at scale. So from one console, we can upload all of these boundaries. And as those are now accessible to all of our spray crews. And that, that, was, a, that was a key part of this because, you know, to get across 50,000 acres, in a very short period of time, you've got multiple crews out operating, and with you know on the fly, sometimes we're mapping. We have a mapping crew working uh, uh, kind of simultaneously with our spray crews, and they can just on the fly in real time upload upload boundaries, and it's accessible to, to all the crews. So that's worked out really well for us. Okay, so. The one constraint being the maps, the next constraint being how do we efficiently move throughout our, uh, our path of travel throughout the day. Uh, we found out with the helicopters that the key is to being able to move quickly, be mobile. You know, we, we, we eventually migrated to running two trailers with our helicopter crews because we knew that you're gonna make up hours in the day and, and make those hours produce acres if you can stay in motion. Anytime that the spray nozzles are not on, you know, we're, we're not we're not making hay. So uh, we, we really had to figure that out with these drones and it, it wasn't clear in the beginning. And we tried many different iterations with trailers and I've seen many of the, many of the different baselines guys are running. Um, we're all kind of, I think we're, we can all agree this is a, a big portion of, uh, of the success here. So our, our trailer specifically was kind of tailored toward the, the custom operator. We run two 330 gallon totes, uh, 8,000 pound axles. And this, these cut trailers are custom to, to, to provide ground clearance, but not to have excessive deck height because we're having to load, uh, unload and load our drones so, so often. Sometimes, you know, 12 to 15 different landing zones in a day. Uh, so we've we've structured this system to be very fast and uh, and to be very light, well as light as possible. We can we can uh, run up to four drones off of one trailer, and we've got the ability because you know we, we've in the past we've we have experienced a lot of uh, interstate travel and, and different things like that. So we wanted to be able to put the drones inside a secure storage. For, uh, for big travel and transit, and then also have the ability while you're in route throughout the day to, to have the drones you know, quickly on and off the back of the trailer. We keep our generators outside, all the exhaust is outside, and for cooling reasons, 
And then we, we actually run all of our drones off the ground and we use our, our top deck just for observation. And we use uh, Bluetooth headsets to communicate between all the pilots, the VOs and the, and the ground crew help. Now, soybeans specifically, <clears throat> not to say that there aren't options with corn, but soybeans can be applicated with any ground sprayer, you know, a tow behind or a self-propelled sprayer. So for aerial to be, a, to be an option, there has to be value there. And that's, that's why this is super important because you've got to find that, that balance between efficacy and efficiency. Either one, if the balance, if the balance is, is too one-sided, uh, we're, not gonna, we're just not gonna hit that mark typically for the, for the average grower or, or chemical retailer to, to find it you know, uh, cost-effective. So you can kind of see here, this is actually a haggy that, this is our haggy in this picture. Uh, we're applicating fungicide on beans. And that's, that's one of the factors, you know, the, you go through a, a beautiful stand of beans like that and you're gonna have some crop damage. So we've got that on our side from the aerial application standpoint. Now, to strike that balance between efficiency and efficacy, uh, we gotta make our, make our time up with our processes. You're going to realize more efficiency in your processes than you will be with your your ground speed of your aircraft or your swath width so if you've got really good efficient processes like pre-mapping all your fields and having a trailer set up that's going to be highly highly efficient and mobile uh you know that's going to that's going to really help you out with showing that that efficiency um you know having things you know all your all your stuff properly configured like uh having your your proper material profiles for your spreading. Having all that stuff done prior to the field is huge. Because once you're out there in the field, the customer is looking at it like it's, you know, you're out there and if you're wasting time, you spend a half a day trying to get your stuff calibrated, uh, that's, that's not, doesn't look too good for the home team. Uh, DJI Relay, we put that into, into play this year pretty substantially. That was a huge uh, asset for us in some of these uh, buried terrain fields and irregular shapes, we're able to kind of uh, mitigate some risk with those line of, those, those line of sites with regard to signal. And we can pre-position either a, a visual observer or a pilot and a relay, and we were able to buy down a lot of risk that way. We saw a huge, huge uh, payoff with that. Now, if you've got these efficient processes and processes in place, now we've, you know, we've got that established. The efficacy now can be, can be more properly calibrated, you know, or kind of get get in the wheelhouse for for good efficacy, which is a slower ground speed, and uh, an application height that's going to work for your field, as opposed to just coming up higher and then just flying as fast as you possibly can, uh, we can actually kind of, we kind of dial that back a little bit to, to realize that, that really good efficacy that we're, you know, we're trying to establish with the drones. Eric. Um, but if, yes, sir. Sorry to interrupt. I, I'm not familiar with the DJI relay. Is, is that, is that a mobile signal booster? Could just, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Um, it's, it's a essentially a re repeater, so it's going to be uh, it's only it's only compatible with the T20P and the T40 at the moment, but it's going to it's going to receive that signal and it's going to go ahead and and retransmit that. Uh, it's, it's very mobile, so you can put it on a tripod or an extended pole or you know there's many different ways to, to utilize it but it, it it turned out to provide a lot of value for us yes. what, what would you say what would you say the effective range uh um acquired or accomplished with that is uh it's 
it's going to be highly dependent on on the situation i think uh at some point you've got to establish you know your distance for line of sight and then also that distance to get back after you're done spraying uh we've we we kind of we kind of have that established within our organization. Um, we're not going to fly over say 3,800 feet, 4,000 feet, regardless of how how far that can transmit. Um, so that's a, it. Probably can transmit a lot further than than we've we've tested it. But within our mission profile, that's that's kind of the limitations we've established for for safety. Uh, hi, sir. Uh, this is Michael from DJI Agriculture, and I already sent a DJI Relay introduction YouTube video in the chat dialogue, and you can have a look for it. And uh, I think if you have more questions, uh, we can have more discussion after Eric's and my presentation. And uh, finally, we have a discuss open discussion part. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yeah, so find the best. Balance between efficacy and efficiency is, is going to be key, uh, given that we, we do have the option to, to spray beans with other means effectively. Now, cover crops. Uh, this, this is, for us here in the United States, this is a, a very emerging market for us. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, incentives that I've seen over the last several years. You know, provided by the the NRCS and the USDA, it's becoming a it's becoming somewhat of a normal agriculture practice throughout the Midwest, and I think that's a great thing. Um, for us, it's a it, it's definitely a great thing because one of the effective ways and the approved ways of the USDA is applying an aerial. I've done this with a helicopter, and I've done this with the drones, and I, I will say the drones do an exceptional job when it comes to cover crop. The challenges come in with the logistics. So we, we have a potential to really grow this, this market as an industry, I feel like. Um, and, and ground handling of the materials is huge. There really isn't at this point an exceptional way to, to fill these drones. We can use tenders that were designed for you know planters and the opening on the T40 spreader is very similar to the size of a of a planter, so it does work as far as as far as that goes. But speed is is key, and bags are fast, but they're very labor intensive. And one of the things that that guys really need to be cognizant of is if you're going to use bags, is to make sure you've got a secure storage for your empty seed bags. Uh, that's that's definitely something that we learned. I learned it from the helicopter side, but also, you know, it became apparent if you if you see a loose seed bag and you've got a couple of T40s running out of the same landing zone, it could be catastrophic if that seed bag gets caught up in the rotor system. So that's something to, to stay kind of kind of keep that in the forefront of your mind. Accurate calibration. Now, I will say that this is where the drones absolutely shine over helicopter buckets. Uh, the helicopter bucket can, you know, can over over the course of a field, oh, sorry, or several tracks, you're going to be able to maintain that that calibration. But as far as acre per acre, I think you're getting a much more precise calibration and a applied rate with the drone. Uh, it's very easy to, to to figure that out. And if you're not getting that, then you've got a calibration issue. And that's that's a going in position problem. Um, you know, it's like the old saying goes, "Trash in is trash out." So if you're going in there with a poor calibration, you're gonna you're gonna get it, you're gonna see it in the field. So having being real familiar with that process of setting up those product profiles, and, and then actually flying that in a controlled environment to verify it prior to going out to the field to actually applicate, if possible, is is definitely the way to go. Um, We've had times where we've switched products right in the middle of a of a of a day. So if a new product comes out that could be due to supply issues or you know unforeseen unforecasted circumstances, this picture on the right, we've we've done calibrations and new product profiles in the field. Uh, you can do it. Uh, 
and it makes your life a lot easier and you look a lot more professional going out there when all your calibration is spot on. And we do check, we found that if you check every load, it's a lot better to find out three loads in that your calibration's off than it is to find out after you've just flown off 6,000 pounds and you're short or you're long, you know. Okay, so here's a picture, or here's a video that we that we made that's just kind of showcases some of the things we just talked about. I should start here. That's cover crop on beans. Let's see here. And so in closing, uh, I just want to just reiterate that I can't put enough emphasis on the mapping. It's it's something that's really easy to be overlooked and you can almost sell yourself on the idea of utilizing the other methods for mapping. But having good RTK base maps and good RTK boundaries is super essential. You're buying down your risk by a, a massive a massive amount and um it's, these are a, these drones are a substantial investment and i think that for us to to grow this industry to where it, it it's eventually going to end up effectively we've got to go out there and be good stewards of the of these processes and, and really come out with a strong position so with that being said michael i'll turn it over to you Okay, thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Um, I will start my sharing again. Uh, Eric, I think you can see my screen very clearly, right? I can. Okay, thanks, Eric. Thank you very much uh, for your sharing. And uh, I have learned many tips and uh, uh, and uh, recommendations from your side and learned a lot of information. So I think your presentation is very helpful and informative. And uh, yes, I, I also think the access is a very first key for the high efficiency and the real effective high efficiency operation for drones because uh, you know the mapping is also a process to help you to fit to be familiar with the work you will need to do in advance like like driving when you drive from your new office to your home you must know that the road where the road and uh, sort of how to move or be more safe and more efficiency right so access is also a very important uh, point maybe we didn't be realize about uh you know be aware of this point uh, previously but next uh, we really suggest uh, to do a mapping in advance to be familiar with their task and their fields in advance it will help to realize a real effective efficiency and uh, uh next uh, um, i will give some solution recommendations from dji agriculture team And uh, here, this is a whole workflow and solutions that we have now. There are several different 
hardware and data and the software for different purposes. And for hardware, uh, as Eric taught, and uh, we can use M3M to acquire crops and field information in advance. Uh, like we can get the RGB and the multispectral imageries, and then we can upload all of those original imageries into two kinds of different software. And what uh, Eric uh, used more frequently is DJI Terra. And the DJI Terra is an offline software. You can use it at any time without network connection. And you can run it on your high performance PC with an individual graphic card. And uh, sometimes maybe uh, people, you know, don't have such high performance PC computer and they you just have your normal computer. And at this time, you can also select it and cloud based platform software. We call it spa smartphone web. And also it can realize a very similar uh, function with DJI Terra. And uh, you can process all the RGB and multi-spectral multi imageries to generate the boundary and flight road or the prescription maps. And we've got such mission information you can upload and download it to your agriculture drones. And both the uh, both of our drones like T40, T30, T20B, and T10, those two small drones can support the can you know get uh, pick up the information from the DJI Terra and the smartphone web. And you can use the instruct instructed mission and task from those two software to perform your mission on the field. And once you finished and once you finish your task, and you, know, you can also see the all the history mission information on our smartphone app on your cell phone, and also you can use this uh, smartphone software on your cell phone to manage all of your drones and your team, and your team, and also and here just uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, uh, uh, when we heard about uh, when we, we learned to the. Uh, work process, the workflow from Eric's team. He mentioned many times for the DRTQ2 and the DJI Relay, and it's just some accessories for our whole workflow, uh, our work solution. And also many people ask the questions in the chat dialogue. And I want to make some uh, explanation for those two products. For DJI uh, DRTQ2 mobile station, uh, it is for the positioning. It's, it is for the positioning. You know, sometimes there is no network on our open field, right? And you can only use the GNSS signal. But for GNSS signal, its process, its procession is sometimes limited, and there always be some, you know, based on the time. And uh, I mean, you know, maybe, maybe uh, in the more, maybe on the uh, on morning, in the morning, nine o'clock a.m., you got position A. Uh, they give uh, they give your coordinates for position A, but uh, till the night, nine o'clock p.m., this position on the GNSS system will be changed. So, position coordinates varies from the time only by GNSS signal. So it will always be some deviation, but sometime for the boundary of the field, just like Eric. Uh, sad, there will always be some power line or the irrigation pe pivot on the ground. The power line is very thin and small and uh, along, along the uh, boundaries, the edges, and the even very tiny uh, elevation, uh, deviation maybe will cause some crash. So at this time, the precise positioning system will be very, very important, helpful. And our DRTQ2 station is such a product to provide the more accurate and more precise uh, positioning service. So it is for mapping. And also, uh, I, uh, I see there is a question, and they ask if you use DRTQ2 uh, uh, DRTQ2 uh, DRTQ station for M3M, for mapping, and if you are uh, needed to uh, use it for the T40, the agriculture drones, the answer is yes. If you use the DRTQ2 station during the mapping process, you must also use the same uh, coordinates and DRTQ2 station for your next operation. So you can uh, so 
only by this point you can keep the same coordinate system uh, from the DRDK2 station, keep the same position for each point on your map. This is a very imp uh, important point. And also for DJI relay, it is uh, used for the signal connection. Uh, you know, as all we know, and, and uh, in the United States, some, not every field is super flat, right? There will always be some rolling hills or the mountain or the, or even some woods in the forest in the middle of the fields. And uh, at that time, it was it will block your signal connection between your remote controller and your drones. At this time, we need a signal repeater, as Eric said. DJI really is a signal repeater. And you, you can build it on the top of the trailer and use a very high pole. So that you can build a connection between the DJI relay and the drones. And the remote controller can build a connection between the remote controller and the DJI relay. So your remote controller can keep communication with your drones. And even uh, there are some hues or the ooze during the in the field of the in, in the middle of the field. So this is the purpose for the DJI relay and uh, the DRTK2 station. So here is the whole workflow solution and products. And if you guys, if you have any more questions, we can uh, discuss about it uh, in the final open discussion part. And the next here is all uh, spring suggestions spring suggestions here in this slide in this page we will we will let you know we will let you know what is we call the real effective efficiency effective efficiency as always known uh, the operation efficiency is related to flying speed and the swath width effective act, act, actually the effective swath width at the same time the operation Efficiency, I mean the effective operation efficiency is not represented by the high flying speed only. It also has the relationship with the effective swath width. So it is decided by the flying speed and swath width together at the same time. So uh, we really, if we want to realize a uh, real high effective efficiency we really to make a, a necessary consideration for efficacy which will be guaranteed by the effective swath width and the penetration ability what we you know why we like the the drones here and in my next slides i will introduce it together and uh, so here we put a picture here and uh, for the as we can see in this picture too big or too small swath ways is not good. We need we need to know what is the real effective swath ways we can set on our remote controller for drones operation, right? This is a very important point here. Please remember it's you know the effective operation efficiency is decided by flying speed and swath ways together. It's not only decided by sp uh, flying speed. So we need to know this point. And also next page is another in very, very important reason why people select and like agricultural drones, because it has the penny downwards penetration spring effect, which will bring us more penetration on the crops, even penetrated the crops, right? And uh, here I, you know, for this, for this page slide, I also discussed and learned many knowledge from Eric's side. And uh, if uh, if everyone who is familiar with head capture will know the ETL effect, effective effective translational lift. With head capture hover in the same position, there will be a huge downward force, right? But the, uh, the vertice, vorticity of the blood will change and they will be almost uh, parallel to the ground when they you know get through the etl speed which means the downwash vorticity will disappear when the speed the forward speed you know gets big enough high enough 
get high enough. The effect will be very similar here for agriculture drones. Here we post several pictures for the spring track of drones and a different flying speed, which uh, you know we have tested for many times for many drones, uh, internal DJI. As we can see, the downward direction is, is uh, the, the flying speed is speed up gradually from 10 feet per second to the even the 45.3 feet per second. As we can see, for the agriculture drones, when the flying speed over 25, what do we find is this? When the flying feed for drones over 25 feet per second, here is a picture over 23 feet per second. This is 32 feet per second, which is the maximum speed that we can support to you, support you to set our remote controller. And uh, we are over this point, 25 feet per second. Maybe it, were, it is very similar for the ETL uh, of the helicopter's ETL speed. Its downwards effect will disappear gradually. As we can see from this picture to this picture, very clear. In under 23 feet, it also has some downwards spring tract, spring tract, right? And but when it reached to 32 feet per second, the spring track is almost to be parallel to the ground. So it means it will lose the penetration, downwards penetration ability. And uh, and when the flying speed over to this, yes, will be like this. As you can see, when, when, when it's flying speed reach to 45.3 feet per second, it will be totally, totally parallel to the ground. So lose the downwards vorticity totally. So here for drones application, I think we will have two options to select. In the first, if you uh, you know, consider more about the efficacy. Uh, you know, we need to, it means we need more penetration power. And if we pursue the high speed for special experience uh, totally, and you can select the higher, you know, definitely can select the higher flying speed. So based on those knowledge here, we, we can recommend you two cans of different flying parameter. And uh, so that's uh, the, th this is also I think you can consider uh, for your future operation and always think about these two solutions. And uh, you know we we need to know when we need uh, you know when we want to get the efficacy first uh, result and what kind of parameters we need to set and when we want the super faster speed and what kind of parameter we can set. Here for FXC, FXC first flying parameter uh, for T40, and uh, there is a recommended swath width is 20, 28 feet, it's around 2.5 meters, and flying speed uh, is around 23 feet per second. It's uh, seven around seven meters per second. So which we show in this picture, we are with the more huge downwash penetration ability. So this is our logic here, why we give such, uh, such a parameter. And uh, uh, you know, uh, in our field, there will always be the flat land and open field, right? And But uh, there is also some hilly land. And for the flat land, we recommend you the 12, 10 to 12, 10 to 12 feet uh, meters high and but for the hilly land we suggest you to set higher uh, you know give the drones more space to do the reaction we need facing the hill uphill uh, especially for the uphill and drop light size you can select a very wide range from 30 uh, 90 to uh, 320 uh, micrometers and the application rate of the gpa here you can set it to the 2.5 gpa and which maybe we will show the better FXC on the fancy side application. And for T30, and if he, uh, because the hardware limitation for T30, so its uh, parameters will be less than T40, like this. And uh, you know, if people really, really want to fly faster to get some special feeling and different experience, definitely you can also select the super fast flying parameters like this, 
the swath ways you can select uh, 32 feet and so around 10 meters and the flying speed you can set to 10 meters per second is around 32 feet per second and the heights and we suggest you fly uh, lower because you know it can help to the penetration and the deposition on the crop canopy and uh, the drop light stays will be same but in such high flying speed and the swath width your application rate won't be go higher you know because some the flow rate and flow rate yes it is flow rate limitation and maybe you can only set to 2 gpa and for such a swath width and flying speed so for different for different application or the different application requirements i think you do have two options to select or to consider to sync and if you want fxc first or if you want the speed first and maybe in the future we'll give you more options about the you know the fxc or the speed first flying parameters recommendation in the future and also must you know our drawings is keep developing and keep developing we will also provide more more and more powerful ability for selection, but these two logic will always be here. You know, win is FXC first, and the win uh, is the sp speed first, and what kind of factors you need to consider. And uh, here is the recommendation for spreading cover crops. This is a actually, I think this is no a new scenario because previously people know the drawings for spring more, but when people bought by all drones they found the drones do have does have more and more application you know possibility like the cover crops are very important as uh, you know uh, eric also introduced his work on this and for t40 the cover crops spreading uh, the flying parameters is relatively more certain than the, the spring you can set it to 26 feet around eight meters and fly maximum flying speed because you know sees more heavy than the drop light and uh, you don't you don't need to worry about its drafting effect or the yes drafting effect in the highs will be uh, uh 14 to 16 feet because also the drafting consideration no drafting so you can set is higher it can raise more wider range and but another uh, another interesting point for cover crops is its application rate. You know, we uh, we have the communication with lots of farmers who plant the cover crops. We found the application rate varies very hugely from different materials. You know, it can vary from the 12 to even 60 and 70 pounds per acre based on the different materials like the radish and winter ray mixture is only 12 or 25 pounds per acre and clover, clover is 12 to 15 pounds per acre and the winter weight maybe 30 pounds per acre and even for some you know research institution recommendations they also suggest that you plant even more less like seven or five pounds per acre so it varies very differently here we also but anyway we have the you know, adaptive solutions for for this huge range application range. Yes, and uh, so uh, here I want to say is we need to use the different hopper gate for spreading system. The standard one on the spreading system by default will provide biggest application rate control. Uh, is this one. This is what we call the standard hopper gate. And also we have two kinds of a small, small hopper gate. And but for small hopper gate, it has a bigger one and a smaller one. For the bigger one, it is suitable for the application rate around 20 pounds per acre. It's around uh, 23 kg per hectare. And also we have another a smaller one. Uh, is it suitable for the application rate around seven pounds per acre, it's around eight kg per hectare, and more, and even more or less. And also here is the introduction videos and to introduce how to use the small hop gate to all those 
publicated, and it is also posted on the YouTube. His video, you can have a reference letter. And also, if we use uh, the drones to do the spreading, we also need to notice another important point is granular template. We need to do the collaboration for different materials, materials and the hopper gate before you before your operation, we need to collaborate and get a template, uh, the flow rate template for different materials. You can finish this step on your with your remote controller, and also uh, it has a video reference in this video, a tutorial video, and you can have a reference letter. Um, here, all right, I think that's all about the content. Uh, the slice part today and uh, thank you everyone thank you very much now if you have any question you can tap in the chat lag or open your mac directly we can have a open discussion thank you very much hey eric this is matt how you doing this morning yeah hi matt good morning hey Good morning. Hey, uh, I noticed on your equipment that your team has uh, on your T40s, you had the row crop pro blades. What exactly? I mean, I obviously know the blades, but uh, how are how are they uh, affecting your uh, uh, efficiency? Is it is it a faster? Is it creating more prop wash? How's that work? Hi, Eric. You didn't. Mute yourself first. You didn't open the mic. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, if you're familiar at all with uh, Van Horn Aviation, so they've been using this these coatings for quite a while with tail, tail rotor blades on helicopters. It's a, it's a, it's the NH. It's called NHP. It's on there, and it makes it much more efficient. You're getting a lot more. Uh, uh, it's quiet because you're getting a lot less resistance on the blade through a rotational plane. And the biggest thing is corrosion resistance. The, the blade does not, that coating does not allow chemical to accumulate on the leading edge or underneath. It, it can't. So it's got a very high hydrophobic effect to it. Um, think about like, a ceramic coating that's becoming more popular in the commercial sector times a hundred. That's essentially what it is. Okay. Yep. And where can I find these or look into get more information about it? <laughs> I, can, I can email you. Okay. Yeah, so I see you can get the email from Harry. You can have an offline <laughs> communication. All right. Sounds good. Yes. Yes. That, yeah. You know, this is a very insight, a very professional suggestions on the blade, you know, because it's not our baseline now for our drones, but and definitely we are considering it later for the future drone. It's a very, very professional suggestions. Thank you. Hey Eric, Hi there. this is this is Jordan. Hey, so I had a quick question. So we've we've got some customers. We're up in Northeast Iowa, so we're very hilly. Um, and one of the things that we deal with is the T40 is not compensating for terrain fast enough when these guys are out doing cornfields. Um, it gets almost to the point where it runs into the corn, and then it flares back, stops, goes up, and then continues. And it's just a disaster of a process for these guys. Um, and so one question was brought up is knowing that the T40 can handle, you know, the inputs of 3D maps from the M3M, doing the spray tree mode and all that kind of stuff. Is there a way that we can take or that you guys have done this where you process um, maps off of the M3M or an M3E and input into the T40 for elevation change? Y yes. Uh and we actually uh, we actually do that in our mapping class. We teach that exact procedure, and it's not going to be an end all be all. You're not going to change the way that the, the T40 uh, the the train follow system works, the hardware side, but it is going to give you an accurate understanding of the terrain, and you can adjust. You can make adjustments in alignment with that 
on your on your settings to compensate more effectively. Okay. Okay. And then I guess when you uh, when you're processing, so you're using Terra. So then when you bring it back into the T40, you have to go through Smart Farm and then back into the T40 is how you're doing it. No, no, from from Terra you can you can upload everything directly from the from the the Agris cloud. Gotcha. Okay. That's all I got for you. Yep. Well, I'll jump back in here again. This is Matt again. Um, <clears throat> as opposed to, I shouldn't say as opposed to. So we are in central eastern Missouri, and uh, MoDOT has an RTK network that I just got signed up with. Are you guys familiar with? utilizing that as opposed to having a uh, standalone rtk system on a tripod tripod excuse me um any any recommendations with that or uh pros and cons of that uh a lot of that depends on on how how wide your area of operation is and and kind of what that looks like and and, and how that aligns with their coverage for consistency uh for us in our operation we we covered you know pretty much all of, of southern indiana um northwestern kentucky and southern illinois and that that vast area we couldn't really make an entrance type protocol work for us uh we needed that reliability to to you know pull that pull that ground station out and have it up and rolling in a couple minutes every time um I, I know that for guys that run in an area where they, you know, I mean, there's guys that they run RTK on their on their tractors, and planters, and, and sprayers, um, in the same fields all the time, and it's it's no big deal, and it works very well for them. I think that that's probably your biggest. It's going to be your biggest constraint there is is how how does your area of operation align with their coverage of their system? Understood. Thank you, sir. Hey, Matt. Actually, I had a comment on that. Um, we have had great success using Digifarm RTK out of Iowa. Um, they are cellular based and they're, I mean, they've got pretty well most of the Midwest covered for base stations. So um, we became a dealer for them because they're about 25 minutes from us as their home base, but they, I used them up in Wisconsin. I've gone all over the place with them. So, and they're very good on customer support. Thanks, Jordan. Eric, I, I thought I remember you saying that on your trailers, the top deck is observation, but you're still flying off of off ground. Did yes, I hear you say that correct? I, I've got I've got some scenarios where I ha I basically have a farm gate to back the trailer in and no no room whatsoever. A access is poor. What any recommendations on flying off of top deck versus versus ground? Just curious on your decisions to go off ground instead of off the top deck. <clears throat> well, coming from the helicopter community, I was I was very uh, acclimated to flying off the deck, you know, and, and the benefits that we realized flying helicopters that way for tail rotor clearance and just safety and, and different things like that. Uh, but one of the things that we definitely also dealt with with the helicopter was uneven ground to park on and just the, the added risk to the crew. Um, if, if something did go wrong with that landing scenario, we can, we can maintain a clear landing zone a lot like we would, you know, bring a medevac helicopter into a road, you know, we can kind of, we can kind of section that off. Uh, but the biggest thing for us was scale. So if we're running two drones, Nonstop, you know, turn after turn after turn. Uh, we we, it's really tough to do that off of a off of a deck um, without having to hover and wait and kind of have a whole air traffic control coordination going on. 
um, versus kind of communicating to your crew that this this drone is coming in coming in and kind of maintain situation situational awareness is a little tougher with the deck. Um, but oh, to answer your question about the access there, with the is it the crop that's that's coming right up to the farm gate? Yeah, I mean, we, we're, we're dealing with, uh, you know, gate funnels and landlocked and, you know, the, the, the field necks and all that where that is the access. So, uh, you know, 70% of the ground we're flying is surrounded at least on three sides by hedgerows, tree rows, you know, the, the fourth, the fourth side is power lines and, you know, you've got a 25 foot gate with crop i mean right up to the gate you know so just access is really tough in some of our scenarios so we we've navigated that that same problem uh and our approach has changed over the years to when the if we're doing custom work for a farmer then when we're mapping the fields out we kind of talk about access right off the bat with them you know, what's access look like here? And if we can both agree going in that the application kind of outweighs the, 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 the constraint with the access, and then we kind of confirm that it's, you know, do you want us to go ahead and maybe back into that crop just a little bit to create a landing zone? Um, do you want us to, because, you know, whatever that crop damage might be is going to be far outweighed by the value of the application. We, we, try, we try to establish that before we ever get to the field. Um, that kind of comes comes with that mapping workflow. Yeah, I, I know I had some situations where I spent more time with the weed eater creating a landing zone and access than I did flying the field. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's kind of where, you know, when you start looking at that, you start calculating all those hours that you spend looking for a landing zone or trying to establish one. It, that That's really where you start to see like an hour of efficiency because we mapped it and we had that conversation can far outweigh, you know, a, a lot of the other things that we, that we definitely focused on in the beginning. We found that we gained the most, the most value and, and the most efficiency and, and profitability on in the operation from getting that stuff out of the way up front. Thank you. Yes, sir. Eric, have you played with the idea of like having some sort of like a fold out platform on the top deck of your trailer? So that way you had more landing space up top at all or no? Yeah, we looked at a, a, a bunch of different designs. Uh, yeah, a lot. we looked at a lot of different approaches. Uh, we looked at slide out decks and, and wings and, and a lot of different things. And really what, what it came down to was, you know, kind of like the just keep it simple and we knew that we could make this work and it was fast and safe and um, tried not to to overcomplicate things. Uh, and that seemed to seem to work pretty well for us. Not to say that that, that that that's not a great use case for for some guys and how they have their operation. I mean, I understand that definitely there's there's a there's a lot of that, that could work better in certain circumstances, but I think across the board and in our area, um, we, we saw a lot of a lot of value from just keeping it simple. Yep, so, and that's kind of where there's a lot of our customers that don't have the ability to park on roads. As some of them are pretty busy highways, and so it's dangerous. And so, what they've asked us for is looking at a trailer that has a platform off the back. Because what they'll do is they'll actually fold it out and then back the platform over top of the corn. And especially when you have power lines along the road too, then you're getting inside the field in the boundary and not touching anything outside the boundary. You know, it's there's a safety thing, but that was up here where it gets kind of tight in some roads and it's hard to, it, the roads are curvy and hilly. So line of sight of vehicles is pretty hard to see, you know, to try and land on roads. That's what we ended up going to. But I don't I guess I was just curious because obviously you guys fly a lot of acres, you know, if that was something that you guys looked at. But. Yeah, and we've done some helicopter flying up in your area, and you know, with that there, we're, we're, we're having to work off the roads a lot of times. They're way too too busy, it seems like, and uh, it's just a struggle. 
you know, it's just part of this part of this industry. It's like trying to navigate those things. And I can definitely see where, where that type of a design would, would, would add value to that. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Jordan, Eric, I have a, I have a <clears throat> eight by 14 platform on the top of our, our rig. And I stopped using it because I, I spent more time turning off downward obstacle and manually dropping it down than I did just going right, you know, right on the ground. It was more efficient yeah. for us. Um, what would it be interesting if DJI could come up with some sort of a pod that you can stick on top of that trailer, like a little puck, if you will. And it's going to land right on top of that puck every time without question. It kind of <laughs> takes, takes out some of the uh, that, uh, uncertainty. This, this is what it just now in my mind. <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, definitely we are considering it. And uh, Sam, uh, if you have more idea or about the requirement, you know, because we just think about this requirement and maybe it were related to many details, right? Many other very dangerous or very considering uh, questions. And if you get any ideas about that, you can, I will leave my email here and you can send to me. And uh, as a very important input here, and we will develop it based on all of your inputs. Thank you. Yep. Drone in the box for a T40. <laughs> for all agriculture T series, T series drones. <laughs> yeah, man, that's why we went to having I when we sell a trailer to a customer, we require RTK on that Digi Farm side. Is so that way we don't have any issues with that. And they usually I mean having those fold up platforms because we do wings on the sides too. So your top platform is actually uh just over twenty feet wide. And then you have a back platform as well. So you have enough room where no obstacle avoidance should be kicked on because it's a total level surface on the top. And then you've got stabilizers on the bottom of the trailer. So that way you don't have to worry about tipping. If you got, you know, two people plus a drone, yeah, it's worst case scenario, but two people plus a drone on the end of that platform, that's, you know, 600 pounds there that you right. got to worry about. And so we put stabilizers on to make sure that trailer stays stable and doesn't tip and have any issues, especially mm -hmm. when you get to the end of the day and you're low on liquid. But, but yeah, we require RTK. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Um, I have not used RTK yet, so you know that's that's one of the things I've learned over the last year because um, I know that I've done some tests and I've set a home point, and every time that thing comes back from whatever route that I'm out flying, I come back out just to test it. I'm guaranteed to be at least six inches off where it took off at. So yeah, so we I did my own test, and this is what validated my mentality at doing the platforms and requiring RTK is because I took a, a three foot by four foot cart, so just a platform rolling cart, and I put it outside, and we took a really windy day. It was 16 mile per hour crosswinds, and I had the drone actually land crossed of the wind so it wasn't in line with the wind it wasn't facing the wind um and with rtk i was able to land three times in a row autonomously on that platform with no issues i mean it was within about two inches okay. with a 16 mile per hour wind and so that's where i said okay we could make this work with a with a fold-out platform being at six foot by 16 foot that's kind of where we're at all right i'm sold <laughs> I could see that. I could see that being very useful. Uh, in addition to any trailer design, you know, if you had that option to use that for that that one use case where it really was critical, you know, if it may not be practical for for every single LZ time in time time out, you know, but it's uh, when you need it, that'd be amazing to have. Yeah, it's it's been taking off pretty fast with these trailers because we just came out with them and we're still finalizing the designs on these wings. You know, we originally were going to do eight foot wings, but then we found the tipping force was going to be too much. So we went down to six foot, um, but even six foot, I mean, you got 12 extra feet up there plus the eight foot trailer. So you got 20 foot there, you know, and that's plenty of room to land up to three drones because you have the main deck as well. Are you transporting your drones on top as well from field to field? We do have a lockdown um, spots that are built into the main deck where they can latch the legs down into the deck if they're only going a couple miles. Otherwise, for long distance travel or end of the day, um, we actually have it built on the main deck towards the back of the trailer. There's a spot um, 
we actually use a scissor lift where they lock down to the scissor lift, fold it up, and it lowers it down into the back of the trailer as an enclosed box from the top deck. So that way you never have to actually carry the drone anywhere. You just lower them down from the top deck. So that way when you get to a field, you just go up on your top deck, you fold out your wings from just electronic control. They lock in, and then you go out there, remove the lid, lift them up, slide them out, pull them out, and go. Yeah. Yeah, I have to consciously think about like because um, I my staircase that I have go up, going up to my top deck is roughly eleven feet eight inches. So and that's above the deck by three feet as a handrail. Uh, so uh, I I would not work very well going through uh, Indiana in the covered bridge area. So I would be toast. Yeah, and that's you know we worry about that sometimes is here. You know, Northeast Iowa, there's some back roads and areas that the power lines are pretty low, you know, so our top railing, because we have a the front of our trailer, we actually built a platform that sticks out over the bed of your truck, whether it's gooseneck or bumper hitch, and that's your, your flight area. So that's your command center. It's got railing around it. That's where you sit. The rest of the deck is open for landing. And okay. so that way, when you go up your stairs, that railing for your command center is right there as your handrail. So you've got plenty of room from where your stairs come up and they run into the trailer. So it's it's kind of, yeah, it goes up from the, the passenger side up towards the driver's side. Right. OK. Yep. This is good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad we got this group together. I am interested, Eric, to talk to you about cranberries because we're heavily involved with the cranberry farms that are up in Wisconsin and, and out in Massachusetts too. We're just we've got a dealership in both areas. And I I used to work with cranberry farmers quite a bit. They're a very tight knit group, kind of like a big family that it takes oh, yeah. hardcore knowledge and selling to get one person even sold. And once one person buys, they all buy, it seems like. So that's what we're working on. But I'd be interested to know because that's we've looked for data. We were trying to find data on using helicopters versus drones. We've got one customer using drones on his cranberry farm. He uses two T40s, spreads at 50 pounds an acre fertilizer in the springtime. He loves it. He can fly off of just two T40 batteries because he dumps so fast. And right, cranberry yeah. beds are just are tiny areas, but they're interlocked around trees. So I'd be interested to know like what your thoughts were on it. Like, do you guys still do helicopter work with cranberries or? Uh, not me personally at this point. When I when I was flying as a, as a line pilot for JBI, we did a tremendous amount. Um, but I mean, I do know that it's starting to catch some traction up in the up in the Massachusetts area. I was up there in late September this year. Um, mm -hmm. And we did some spreading. We did some 100 pounds to the acre single pass with T40 on some dry fertilizer, and I think it came out pretty well. So, gotcha. yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that I think is going to be a it's definitely going to be be a, a market, a strong market for for drones. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. We've got a dealer out there, and he's trying to keep it rolling and figure out how he's going to this with these customers because they're pretty involved with them already so yeah is that in wisconsin uh massachusetts okay we've got one in each um our dealer is over by carver massachusetts that uh dealer for drones or yeah okay Yep, we met them. We got invited. We worked with in Wisconsin, and then there was a buyer that was from Massachusetts that invited us out to go out to Massachusetts and do one of their shows out there. So we went out there and got connected with them, and they're like, hey, can we start something out here? Because we already work with all of them on product, and said, sure. So, yep. Yeah, that's actually where I was at in September. <laughs> Is in Carver. So yeah, was did in, you uh, work with uh, Scott Hanula then? I know Scott very well. Okay. Uh, I, di I didn't work with Scott on on this project. I was with uh, AD Makepeace, but. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Makepeace. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I don't know. Scott went with a different brand that was out of Florida that was a U.S.-based drone that does, I want to say it holds like seven gallons, something like that. So that's why I was very shocked when he didn't go with the T40 because we've done demos and stuff out there for him and shown him, and we did a live demo at their Cranberry show, and yeah. I think the T40s will do very well in Massachusetts. Yeah, and that's what I'm kind of just shocked. Um, that he chose a different brand, knowing the um, the rep that DJI has, you know. But yeah, we'll keep working at it. I mean, it's definitely going to be a struggle, but we also do a ton of work in Wisconsin too. So, and those guys talk a lot between Massachusetts and Wisconsin. I think Wisconsin will be a at it'll it'll scale faster. Um, but JBI still does a very good job in, in that Massachusetts yeah. market. They're 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 exceptional in every way. So um, I, I think that I think that it's going to catch traction. It's just going to take some time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. JBI. I mean, they do a fantastic job, and they've always got a good impact there. So that was that was the hardest part. You know, we've got a couple T30s that were sold out there right away and and they apparently like them a lot but i'm kind of surprised it hasn't taken off faster than that <clears throat> hey guys my last question would be uh are the slides that were uh available today are they going to be stored somewhere or do we have access to them in the future if just for reference uh, yes, we will share it by email and we will upload the video recording on the YouTube. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, we have a, we have made a very, very depth and discussion about this uh, drawing applications today. And I think if later uh, we have any more questions, we can keep contact and uh, Eric, and I think you can also share your email address here on the chat dialogue, and uh, maybe if guys have another question, they can contact you. And, the, and uh, I also share my email on the dialogue, and everybody can save it, and the end question, uh, feel free to contact me. Yeah, there's my, uh, I just posted my, my email address there. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions as well about the the blade coatings and and stuff like that via email. Oh, do, <laughs> Erica, do you know the recent emails for soybean? <laughs> Uh, maybe from my side, I haven't heard something from some farmers. Uh, let me check first. Wait a minute. Uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Oh, wow. All these, all these questions didn't show up at first. Okay. Yeah, I had to refresh my chat just to see it all. Because when he said he was, you, you were posting your email in there, I was like, uh, I don't see anything. So yeah, his stuff just posted okay. here. So. Oh, there is. Uh, yes, hi Keith, and uh, I think there is no some number for the yield because maybe farmers will care about this more. But there is a figure they told me, you know. For the yield lose per acre caused uh, caused by the uh, wheel track, and they told me a number. If we use drone without the wheel track, they can save at least uh, two bushels per acre for soybean. Yeah. Yes, two bushels per acre for soybean. Yeah, this is the number they told me. But the total total yield number they didn't tell me. See. Hey, uh, 
OK, all right. All right, thank you for the attendance today. And uh, I think uh, Eric, do you have any more questions or something you want to say or? Uh, no, I just thanks for everybody for coming out. This was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I appreciate the opportunity and yeah, my emails there in the in the comments. And if anybody wants to reach out with any other questions, feel free and I'll keep you keep everybody posted. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for your attendance. Yeah, so we, we learned a lot of things. Yes. No matter in this during this webinar, all the all our pre discussion, I learned a lot of knowledge from your side. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. Thank so thank you guys, and we are into the session. Thank you very much. See you next time.